Hey you, Vlad here from DevInsideU.com. Welcome to the second video about diamond architecture. In the previous one, we saw the big picture. Today, we're gonna have a little bit more code. Let's get right to it. Before we get into this, as a reminder, I could write an entire book about this. So this is supposed to be just an elevator pitch. So there will be many details missing. With that out of the way, let's begin right out of the message from our sponsors, which is you or people like you. We're currently on the road to 500 patrons who collectively help me pay for an editor. Instead of spending time editing videos, I prefer to concentrate on creating awesome content or for example, hang out with you during live streams. In the last week, 16% offer already expired. But if you choose to pay annually, you get a 7% discount still. Thank you to all of my existing and future patrons. I couldn't have done it without you. I only have one new slide, but I want to quickly recap all the previous slides that we have seen in the previous video. All right. So as a reminder, it's called diamond architecture because the boxes that represent the dependencies can be arranged in such a way that they form a diamond. All right. So the first slide was about what architecture is. It's just a guideline for managing dependencies. The second slide was about, uh, you know, what the goal is. And by the way, I rubbed a couple of people the wrong way when I said that I don't really know what architecture is for, you know, what the goal of architecture is. Obviously, this was a poor choice of words. I know what an architecture is for. However, different architectures are optimized for different things. And this one is optimized for build times. If build times are not one of your concerns, then the diamond architecture is not for you. What is a good architecture? It should be simple, technology agnostic, stack agnostic, scalable in terms of the size of the project and the cost. It doesn't need to be universal. You know, it doesn't need to be applicable for games or embedded design or something. Like that. And what does simple mean? And this is pretty much like what formalizes the diamond architecture, right? So everything depends on the core. Core is kind of like at the top with minimal dependence main depends on everything, right? So it's at the bottom, it's at the apex of the diamond, and all other dependencies are capped to the minimum. Also, naming doesn't really matter, right? Just have something at the top, I call it core, you can call it something else. Have something at the bottom, I call it main, you can call it something else like edge or entry point or you get the idea. Then we had this slide, which uh, I, by the way, did a little bit incorrectly because it kind of creates this impression that main only has a dependency on core. No, it actually has an arrow to each of these boxes, all the blue boxes and all the green boxes. And by the way, I think I forgot to mention why I chose these particular colors because the core and the main, they're sort of like choke points. You know, everything has to wait until the core finishes compiling and the main has to wait until everything else finishes compiling. And the blue ones, uh, you know, and the green ones are the ones where you get like the most gains, but we get like the really the most gains from the green ones because we're going to have way more of them, right? So the distribution between team blue and team green is not uniform, okay? So there's going to be like one or two boxes that call the core and all the other boxes are going to be called by the core. One other thing that I forgot to mention is tasks. Like technically each of these boxes is going to have, I'm going to use the word mirror, but the word mirror is not actually correct, but kind of you have like a shifted diamond uh, right next to it. Okay, I don't have a I don't have a diagram uh, of it. But for example, this delivery is going to have a it's going to have test for delivery. This Kafka consumer is going to have a test for the for, for the consumer and so on. I still call them unit tests because you can only test them like in a single unit. You cannot integrate anything over here. If you want to integrate, you will need will need to do it here. But anyway, in any case, the point is that the tests are obviously also compiled in parallel, right? So you kind of have like all of these boxes twice, and uh, all of them are compiled in parallel. Obviously, as soon as they're uh, you know, their production level code compiles. Then we had another slide with, uh, yeah, so uh, if you have like, if you're using the same library all over the place, like for example, lib5 over here, here and here, you might have a util and it technically becomes on the level one because it compiles in parallel with the core, but I prefer to still call it like as it as, as if it was on the, on the layer two. And therefore, I also prefer not to use the word layers. I prefer to use sort of like the word like, like, a, like a grid, okay? And you have like something like on the first, uh, you know, row of the grid and, it, it's kind of the same thing. You, you get the idea, okay? Core at the top, main at the bottom, everything else is in the middle. Keep it simple. The next one is the one where we had this tiny error. Um, like you, you should try to avoid this error, but occasionally you will have some util that uses something from the core, or at least like the headers from the core. I believe in the previous video, the example was something like logging, okay? If you have like a trait for logging defined in the core, and one of these util or, or tracing, you know, and one of these utils does something, you know, injects tracing automatically or something, then, you know, it's not such a big deal to, to have this error because there will be only a couple of files here. Like how many utils can you have? The next slide was um, sort of an experiment where I said, okay, I, I even found a way to move the core down to these green ones and leaving only only the headers of the core over, over here. I actually had uh, another sort of like epiphany, but I'm not sure about it. We, we might actually do it live real quick uh, because the, the thing is that over here, you're going to have the trait 
for these guys to call, but you also have traits for all of these ones to implement. And I realized that maybe these traits that are being implemented, maybe they can be moved out out of this one, right? But it will still need to have a dependency on, on the core headers. So you might have like core headers or boundaries, and then you might also have, uh, I usually call them gates. Uh, we could call them like gate headers. It's going to be like somewhere here in the middle and it will have a dependency on this. The problem with it though is that it will make sure that these ones can com can start compiling a little bit sooner. However, we don't gain that much because you only have like one or two of them. Uh, on the other hand, it will actually slow down these ones, right? Because we still need to compile the core and then we would need to compile the gate headers. The next slide is about the big ball mod, right? So essentially, if you're not starting a fresh project, if you want to build this uh, uh, into a new, into an already existing project, build it on top uh, with a new namespace. I'm actually thinking about, uh, I might actually start doing this next week. Uh, well, not for you. Uh, I'm, I'm actually considering uh, rewriting one of the existing projects into the diamond architecture and I'm considering doing this live. So uh, subscribe not to miss it. Okay, this was the last one. Okay, and then this is how the video ended. I said, you know, what are you waiting for? All right. And so today I added pretty much only one slide and uh, I kind of have a problem uh, with content creation because as a content creator, like I'm, I'm kind of talking to the lens. I'm not talking directly to you. And so I have no way to know how much you know. So what I'm going to say next is either going to be extremely obvious to you or or, you know, it's going to blow your mind, okay? So essentially, all I want to say is that um, these green boxes and the blue boxes, if we go back a little bit, like all of them somehow depend on the core. And if you have a couple of years of experience, you know where this is going. This, is going, this goes into uh, the only trick that, that we as developers have, right? You know, just another level of indirection. Essentially, uh, the arrows that point from the green stuff to the core are going to be the typical UML errors, right? The, the extends errors. And I have a slide for this. Okay. So on the left, you kind of have the same diamond as we had before. It, it shows you the uh, build errors, right? So you have the main, which depends on everything on all of these things that I kind of call like the inputs and you're going to have like one or two or sometimes even four of them. They will all call core at some point. And then you have like these ones that are called like the, the outputs, right? In the, in the build uh, model, uh, the output depends on the core. Like all the errors are the same. It's just like a, an actual dependency between, you know, sub project. And over here, this is um, uh, this is a diagram more of what is inside of your projects, right? Your classes, your your interfaces, right? And so the main assembles the whole thing, right? It starts some sort of server, some sort of scheduler, uh, you know, starts some sort of like uh, Kafka consumer, right? And then it's going to be like stuck in the loop. And whenever something happens, like a message comes in, uh, an HTTP call comes in, a uh, user taps something in, then we're going to call a method on some trait over here, right? The implementation of that trait, because this is like the core headers version, is going to be over here, right? In the output, there's going to be some core, right? And the implementation is going to have a dependency on yet another trait. And this is the one that I talked about just now, you know, the, the gate headers, right? So for now, they're all over here. So there are two kinds of traits here. You know, one is for the for the input to call and uh, the other traits are for the output to implement, okay? So usually I call them uh, boundary. So the input go through the boundary to call the core. The other ones I call gate. I used to call them gateway. Gate is a little bit shorter, okay? So I have a gate. Usually a gate is a facade for all of these like 99 other traits, okay? And so through this facade, you go to these other ones, right? So this this arrow changes now and this arrow kind of disappears, okay? So this is kind of like the uh, request response cycle, request response, request response. You know, if you need to publish a Kafka message or something, then it's gonna be it's gonna be over here, okay? So the only trick in the book that we have, dependency inversion, right? Just another level of indirection. And the assumption is that all of this compiles faster as long as the traits, you know, as long as the interfaces don't change. So if you're still in the build out phase where you build a prototype, for example, then, you know, good software principles are not for you anyway. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with building a prototype. Just don't forget to throw it out when the time comes. What I will show you next is, as I promised you, there will be a little bit more code, is uh, two projects. One is pretty much empty, but it uh, it recreates uh, pretty much this uh, entire structure, like something like this, right? I, I actually called the, the sub-projects like this, okay? Uh, but it's pretty empty, okay? And uh, the other one is the to-do app that I have built through, you know, through the years. Uh, first it was in the video about the cake pattern, then we have rewritten it into the tagless final style, then we have rewritten it into Zio. And so the latest version is with Zio. So I took the one with, with a Zio and we're gonna walk through it a little bit because it already implements a diamond architecture. If you are new to this channel, this is a channel about Scala. It's written in Scala, but this diamond architecture works uh, pretty much in everything. If you have seen me building this to-do app, you can pretty much skip this portion, which is going to be in the end. All right. So uh, what I have over here is a uh, repo called uh, Diamond Slides. 
Okay, so um, this is the one where I pretty much recreated this one, this one slide. Okay, so as you can see over here, there are, there aren't any folders, and the way it works is that basically you need to clone it, and then you need to start SBT, which is a Scala build tool, uh, or you know if you're using something metals, and all the all the folders will be created for you. What I have done for you is, and by the way, I'm going to create an entire playlist about that diamond architecture. I kind of already have, so if you open it, as of right now, there's only this first video. Then I'm going to like once I finish making this one, it's going to be over here, and then I'm going to insert a bunch of other videos where I pretty much um, recorded parts of the diamond architecture and I'm going to point out a couple of them once we're going to go through the uh, through the app okay so what I've done for you is I created a a dependency graph over here okay and so what I will do is I will actually uh, open it over here okay and I will click on history and you will see that there are four commits the first one is without utils so it's basically uh, basically this one, okay? The second one is going to be with utils, is this one. Then there's going to be one where uh, utils depends on core, okay? So it's going to be without utils, with utils, and I'm actually going to increase the font a little bit. And uh, lib5 depends on core, and also I, I created also lib7, that it also depends on core. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here, we're going to see view at this point in history, and I'm going to open it, one, two, three, four. And I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to click on raw, same thing, raw, same thing, raw, the same thing, raw. This is essentially exactly what this was uh, over here. Hold on, let me actually close a couple of these ones. This one and this one. This one over here, right? So now the, the picture that you saw over here is actually generated uh, with Bluepen. I'll show you a little bit later how it was generated. Uh, but effectively, it's exactly the same thing. So unfortunately, it's on the side. I need to learn graph with at some point. Maybe I can flip it. So this is like the top of the diamond, the core headers. And then you have a main over here and you have everything else in the middle. Everything else compiles in parallel. Okay. So the second version is this one that also has lib5 and lib7. And they kind of like float to the first, uh, first layer because now they will compile in parallel, right? In parallel was where's the core. Okay, and you have like everything it has that uses lib5 now uh, goes to lib5 util and everything that uses lib7 goes to lib7 util. Okay, and the next one is kind of it's kind of hard to read, but actually the only thing that happened is that these um, these three arrows, right? So the one that goes from lib5 over here to core, uh, this one that goes from external stripe to core, and this one that goes from delivery HTTP lib5 to core, it, they disappeared. And why did they disappear? Because they transit, transitively depend on core, right? So lib5 util now depends on core. It just said the rendering changed completely, and so it looks very different, okay? So as you can see, it's, it's these five, they go to lib5 util. They don't have direct arrows on core headers. Uh, I actually did it on purpose so that the diagram would be uh, a little bit more simple, but lib5 util depends on core. This is this example where you would have like logging or tracing inside of core and you would have some utils for this. And lib7 doesn't, right? So technically like you don't see it, but core headers uh, will compile in parallel with lib7 uh, util, okay? And the next one is where uh, where both of them, uh, both lib5 and lib7 uh, depend on core and therefore like all of these have the transitive dependencies. I don't recommend you doing it like this, right? So a better option is where, where these errors don't exist, right? Because then, uh, you know, things compile um, even even more in parallel, okay? I want to show you a little bit how it's done in, uh, you know, in SBT. Uh, if you're not a Scala developer, don't worry too much about it. It's more important to understand, like, how, how the folders are called and the fact that the folders uh, are called slightly different than than these sub-projects, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here, and um, I'm using WSL, and I'm going to go over here. I'm going to use the GitHub CLI. I actually have a video about it. You might want to check it out. And uh, so this is my Ubuntu distribution, which has a dev directory, which only has the Zero to Do app, which I will show you a bit later. So we're just going to do this, the diamond slides, and I'm going to go into them, diamond slides, and I'm going to open them with Visual Studio Code. And as you can see, um, there are only the 01 core and 03 main directories. However, as soon as I import the project, um, the uh, folders will be will be generated for us. Okay, so I'm going to import the build. And while it imports, I'm actually going to show you the build file over here. And by the way, recently I uh, I started having the um, the sidebar on the right, so it might be a little bit confusing. Okay, but yeah, it's it's a sidebar that is usually on the left. Okay, so once it finishes building, uh, a bunch of uh, folders will be generated over here. Uh, you can actually look through the changes that I did. Uh, the This project was generated with one of my Jitra templates. If you have been uh, watching my videos for quite some time, then you know what I'm talking about. If not, um, Jitra is a tool that can uh, generate projects for you. It basically can generate 
like any directory structure for you. It's uh, very widely used in Scala. So as you can see, the folders are already generated, but they're empty. The way this works is that basically we have like, this is an SBT thing, we have like a, a root project called Diamond Slides and it aggregates all of these, right? So it aggregates the core headers, it aggregates these two libraries, it aggregates the team blue, which are these ones, and it aggregates the team um, team green, which is all of these ones. Uh, as you can see, like the the projects are actually called like this, but the folder for this one, for example, is called like this, right? So it's basically it's on the layer two or on like the grid thing too. And I started marking down was like input and output, right? So team blue is input, uh, team green is output, and uh, team yellow is C, and C stands for common, right? I had a choice between like common or shared, but I kind of wanted wanted them to be at the top, right? So this way they, um, they all kind of always like stay sorted and organized and they sort of remind you of the layers, right? So this way the core headers is always at the top, main is always at the bottom, and you have like the input and output uh, and, the, and these common libraries in the middle and they're kind of like on the layer two because technically they're not. Obviously, like if you're a Scala developer, just look at the change sets, you know, look at the repo, okay? So essentially uh, we start with the core headers and the folder is going to be called 01 hyphen core headers and it will have some dependencies, but usually, you know, try to minimize these dependencies as fast as possible. If you're doing something like uh, tagless final, uh, you might even need to have uh, cats over here. If you use Zio, you will need to have Zio even at the very top. Okay, uh, then we have like these these common libraries, right? So you have uh, lib5 util. Uh, it will have a dependency on lib5. Uh, then you're gonna have the inputs, right? So these are deliveries. They all have a dependency on. So so what you see over here is the last change set, right? So this is the one, um, you know, where. Um, like this one, where lib5 and lib7, uh, they depend on the core, okay? So uh, because lib5 and lib7, they, they depend on the on the core headers, uh, this one, the delivery HTTP, even though it's called lib5, it does not need a direct dependency on lib5 because it's going to have it transitively, right? So it depends on lib5 util, which is over here. lib5util is going to have a dependency on some imaginary lib5, and it also is going to have on uh, a dependency on the uh, core headers, right? So lib5util obviously is going to have some binary dependency on lib5 and a dependency on the core headers, okay? And so on. So they, they just keep going like this, okay? So the input's finished. Over here, the output start, right? You have the core, less the better. Uh, you have like persistence and all of the, I, I recreate, I literally recreated the slides. And at the bottom you have the main, which has a dependency on all of them, right? You don't need to depend on core headers because it's going to be transitive. You don't need to have a dependency on these utils because it's going to be transitive. So essentially you have your team blue, you have your team green, and, and that's it. Okay, so uh, I'll show you how I generated these graphs. So uh, basically like this. So if you're using Bloop, uh, you can just run the Bloop project, uh, pass it dot graph. I removed the test dependencies. I removed the name of the project, which in this case is actually Diamond Slides. Okay, so it's going to be Diamond, Diamond Slides. And I call it DG uh, because I have a global git ignore file which ignores a file called dependency graph. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to see that uh, a dependency graph is going to be generated. And you can actually preview it if you have some SVG plugin that I do have, uh, which is over here. Okay, so this is exactly exactly the diagram that I just saw and I actually committed it, right? So, um, so this one is get ignored, uh, but but this one is not, right? So this is exactly the one that um, that you saw, okay, previous VG, there you go. One of the reasons also why I'm using these names for the folders is that the diffs are super tiny because the project itself, for example, over here, is not called 02i, it's called job processors lib9. And therefore, if you, you know, if you start renaming it, if you start moving it, there's no package that is called like this, you know, there's no project that is called like this. So, uh, you know, so if you have like scripts that do something with your project, like not much is going to change. And, you know, Git understands uh, renames. So it's all going to look, uh, look really good. All right, so I'm actually going to close this one and we're going to open the uh, the other one, you know, the Zio, uh, Zio to do. So I'm going to open it in VS Code. So this one technically contains four diamonds uh, because, uh, so this is a simple to-do app if you have never seen it. Uh, I probably I will, I will run it at some point. Um, but essentially what you see over here is is uh, four diamonds. Okay, so you kind of have like the core headers. And by the way, for the people who have seen my Zero to-do, I actually created uh, one one uh, commit uh, over here and I and I put it on on an extra branch, core headers, not to confuse the people who haven't, haven't seen this video. Okay, but if you want to see it, it's basically the one where I ripped out the uh, trait from the core and I put it into the core headers uh, where I actually had two of them okay and I um, 
and I had to rename the implementation from boundary to boundary, uh, boundary impl. By the way, this tool is called uh, Delta, and I have a video about it. Okay, so basically the calls to boundary have changed now, and uh, let's see what else, what else, what else. Yeah, so the build changed a little bit. Okay, not important. In any case, so uh, what you see here is kind of like four diamonds. So you have like the core headers at the top, and I actually have some sort of version of a dependency graph. Let's actually see how recent it is. Yeah, it is actually very recent. Okay, so it's kind of hard to see because we see four diamonds at the same time. We're actually going to remove three of them um, in, in just a second. Okay, so uh, you have the core headers, and you have like this util, util thingy, okay, over here. They're called like one, it should, should actually be called two. Okay, but this is like an old kind of thing. I didn't, I didn't rename it. Okay, it should be called uh, two. In fact, I'm actually going to show you how easy it is to rename it. So I'm just going to go over here. I'm going to do like a two over here. Okay, and I'm going to go into the build file, and I'm going to go over here. And I'm going to say that this is now called two, right? Because everything else, uh, you know, stays the same. I'm going to import the build. I'm going to wait a couple of seconds, and I'm going to cut it out from the video. Okay, so it finished, uh, which means that if I were to go and generate the graph now. Okay, so this is going to be, you know, uh, I believe it's just called to do. The graph is not going to change, right? Because why would it change? You know, it's the project stayed the same. Uh, we didn't change any dependencies, right? We 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 just uh, we just renamed the uh, just renamed the folder, okay? And by the way, in this particular case. Uh, no, actually, I'm right. Right, it, it has to be like on the. It's called on the layer two, but it but comp, it compiles in parallel uh, with level one. In, in any case, what I wanted to show you is that um, if I look at the diff, right, it kind of looks like I I changed a lot. However, if I actually commit this somehow, you know, blah. Well, actually, I can just do a grip, right? So this. Um, creates this work in progress dev and look look how it actually looks like so this is how it will look like on github it will look like a rename okay it will look like i just renamed this okay so the entire like the fact that i renamed the directory is, is super um easy for um for git to understand okay uh i'm gonna leave it like this but i'm not i'm not gonna push it but i'm gonna leave it like this okay so uh why are these four diamonds it's essentially because we have two ways to persist data and two ways to deliver the application right we can deliver it in a terminal or we can deliver it via http and therefore you have like these four combinations you have four uh main methods i'm actually going to show it to you real quick so let's say for example that we want to run this one this is the main uh which means that the, the the delivery portion of it is going to be simply uh over here which means it's just a terminal application but it will actually use the postgres database so it's going to go over here okay so uh i'm actually going to do this and i'm going to go into terminal and i'm going to launch sbt which is the scala build tool and uh, we're going to have like these uh four main methods and i'm actually not sure if i'm running docker uh let me actually check uh, Docker PS, it's not running. Uh, service Docker start. There we go. We're gonna do uh, main Postgres skunk and we're gonna run it. Okay, so this is going to be a terminal application. And by the way, you see the compilation in action. So it should be okay. This is only incremental compilation. Okay, so it kind of it kind of looks like this. Uh, you can like show all to dos, which is you know something in a database. You can create a to do some like uh, uh, buy milk. And uh, 2022, uh, let's say that we're going to go with um, April and uh, we're going to go with uh, 17 is today and let's say 18, uh, 45. So we're going to do like show all and now it's over here. Right, so April 17, 1845, as you can see, I'm recording this on a, on a Sunday, okay? So now we can uh, quit this and now I'm going to run, uh, for example, the one with the HTTP. Postgres Kong, right? So this is the one that is uh, over here, right? So it doesn't use the uh, regular delivery mechanism. It uses the HTTP delivery mechanism. It still uses the database, okay? So we're going to do a restart in this case, okay? And I have a tiny uh, file over here which uses a VS Code plugin where I can uh, simply send requests, okay? So if I do like show all like this, then you're going to see like all of the all of the, all of of the the to-dos over there, okay? And I cr can create a couple and I can show them all and there we go, okay? So what I'm actually going to do now before before I walk through this whole thing, just not to, um, you know, not to confuse you, I'm going to go to the build file, okay, like this. And I'm actually going to say that uh, we're not going to have this delivery. We're not going to have uh, this persistence. And we're not going to have, like, any of these three main methods, okay? So essentially, we're going to go and... Um, 
comment out this delivery. Uh, we're gonna comment out this persistence, and now we're gonna find like these uh, mains. This one, this one, this one. Comment them out like this, and we're going to import the changes. Okay, and so essentially now we're left only with this HTTP version. Okay, I just want to uh, generate the dependency graph again so that you see, you know, our our good old diamond. Okay, instead of like these four diamonds um, uh, being thrown into one. Okay, so we're gonna go over here and we're going to say blue project blah 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 like this. And by the way, um, in case we want to run it, uh, we're also gonna like reload over here. Um, so it's over here, and let's do a preview. And it's still the old preview. I believe that this is um, did I call dependency graph? Yes, I yes I did. Okay, hold up, something didn't refresh. Preview. There we go. Okay, this looks much much better. Where is it? Over here close all the others okay so this is now you know more more familiar to us right so we have the core headers at the top we have team yellow over here which is just like this tiny util we have the persistence postgres current over here which is team green we have the core which is also team green we have delivery which is team blue and at the apex apex of our diamond we have our main so for the people who have seen the to do app uh, you can pretty much stop watching here uh, for the people who haven't seen it I'm just gonna quickly run through this entire code base but essentially all you need to know is that there are traits over here Right. There are traits over here, there's an implementation of the traits over here, there's an implementation of the trait over here, and uh, whatever is in here calls this trait. Okay, so we're gonna go and uh, we're going to start with the main uh, for HTTP Postgres, um, this one. Okay, so as a reminder, I told you that the main will have only three things. The first one is a one-liner, which simply runs your program. Okay, uh, the types are going to be a little bit complicated because we use you. Okay, so it simply does like program make exit code. So as you can see over here, okay, so we are in uh, over here. Okay, so uh, this is the main. This is where we are. The folder is called source main Scala dev inside you, and then the name of the application wishes to do, and then nothing else. Right, because this is the entry point, so we don't care about the use cases. The diamond architecture is built around the use cases, and as a reminder, it's not just an architecture. I also developed an entire like um, uh, design system for like how to name things and so on. I'm not gonna go in depth into that part, uh, but maybe I won't be able to resist. So this is the first thing: one line to start your program, then the actual program, and the actual program assembles all of the already assembled use cases. Okay, so if we go to program, the namespace or the bounded context will be the same. This video is going to be also in the in the playlist called bounding context. Okay, so over here, you know, we're creating a session pool for Postgres. We making we're creating our controllers. Controllers are usually the ones that are in the in the deliveries, right? I, I call them controllers. You can call them however you want. Just decide on something with your team and use the same name uh, in all, uh, for all of the use cases. Okay, we're creating two controllers. In this case, there are there are only two two of them. So this is a CRUD application. One of the controllers is going to do all of the read, update, and delete, and one of them is going to do the create, the insert. Okay, so we have we have two of them over here. Okay, so these ones like CRUD.make, these are already assembled use cases, already assembled controllers. Okay, the program only puts them all together. Usually it just registers them. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this is an HTTP app. So it just creates like a controller. Just a, it's just something that has a bunch of routes. Okay, so if you go to the controller, you know, it's just something that has routes. Every use case therefore is a controller. So we assemble a bunch of controllers over here. We, we take the, put them all together. Okay, if we open CRUD over here, right? As a reminder, we're still we're still in the main. Okay, so we have like two use cases. They happen to be inside of each other, uh, but it's not it's not required. Okay, so we have CRUD and we have insert, and both of them have a dependency injection. Okay, so again, you have three things: one line over here, over here you have a place that assembles everything together, and over here you, you assemble each individual use case. So each of them assembles its own controller, and the controller is just a bunch of routes in our case. Okay, for example, the insert one is going to be very tiny. Okay, and by the way, in Scala three, uh, you can have top level definitions. So this is a top level method. Okay, it just says make. It receives a couple of things. It creates a Postgres gate. It creates a controller. It it creates a it creates a boundary. Puts them all together, right? Essentially, you have controller needs a boundary. Boundary needs a gate. Super simple. And a gate is just a facade for the entire team green. Okay. If you look at this this other one, it's gonna look very very similar, right? We're assembling a controller. A controller needs a boundary. A boundary needs a gate. 
they all look the same. Eventually, they end up over here. They're being assembled together. And usually, this assembly is just like a registering of routes, for example. Let's look at this one, the, the insert one, because it's, it's actually small. Okay? So the first, one, the first thing that is happening is that we're creating a controller. So if we go over there, uh, we're going to see some very, very specific code for HTTP, right? So over here, we're using a library called HTTP4S, which is why it's delivery, like technically it should be called like 02 hyphen uh, I for input because this is team blue. This is a delivery. How are we delivering with HTTP? What library are we using HTTP4S? We're not going to go into like the Scala code, but the only po point is that it has a dependency on the boundary, okay? And the boundary is a trait inside of the core headers. If you go into core headers, there will be insert over here and it's going to have a boundary by the way notice that there are no packages like again we're talking we're, where we're sort of switching to this de uh, design system right there is no package that is called core there's no package that is called core headers there's no package that is called delivery right the packages are always the same right so in this particular case it's dev inside you to do crud insert okay which means that if we go back to the controller uh of uh this one dev inside you to do crowd insert, exactly the same package, okay? So this boundary is just a trait. It's basically, hey, what can Team Blue call on the core? Through which boundary do we need to go? Through this one. You can create one, you can create many. What are we creating? Well, we're creating these to-dos. Where are they? They have to be at the same place, right? So we're creating these to-dos over here, right? To do is just a case class. If you're not a Scala developer, case classes are a way to uh, define data structures in Scala. Essentially, you only have traits and the types that are required to make the trace compile, right? So the boundary will produce a to-do, therefore the to-do needs to be over here as well, okay? Now, these are the core headers, and so if we go back, go back over here to the controller. The controller needs a boundary, which is just a trait. So if we go back to the dependency injection, uh, which is over here, right? So this is where we're creating the, the, the insert. How are we constructing the boundary? Well, boundary implementation dot make. So if we go there, boundary implementation is now in the core, right? So remember, I moved the core down to, to team green. Okay, so now it's like for some reason at zero two, right? And it and it follows the same. So first of all, it just implement implements create one and create many. And how does it do it? Well, it needs to call something on on team green, right? So it needs to go through some sort of gate to access the database, to access the config loader, to talk to Google Maps, to talk all of the other things. It needs to talk to the gate. The gate again is just a trait. Where is it? It's in core headers. Okay, so it's over here in core headers. Again, it's just a trait. Same same deal. Right? This is exactly where this arrow comes from. Right? So a gate is over here, the implementations are somewhere else. Now this is a very simple app. Usually this gate would be a facade, and I have a video about this, and it would have like a bunch of other traits because you're gonna have like 99 of these green boxes. You need a trait for each one of them, right? You're not gonna need them in every use case. So for example, in the insert use case, you will probably only talk to the database, maybe to some config. That's it. But you're not going to talk to like the Google Maps API to to insert a, a to do, right? So you're going to have like as many traits as necessary, right? But the maximum is like as many as as many green boxes as you have. Okay, let's go back back to the dependency injection point. Like, how are we get, getting the gate? Well, there is some flat mapping because there's some monads and stuff going on. But essentially, we, we're going to the Postgres gate and we're going to make it right. Where are we? Well, all of a sudden, we're in Team Green zero two persistence Postgres skunk, same package. Right, same directory structure, Postgres gate. What does it do? Well, it just implements the gate. It implements create many, and it has a private dev called insert one. And that's it, okay? So now this entire use case uh, is assembled over here, right? We can also look at the other one, but it's going to be exactly the same, okay? So for example, this one, it creates the, you know, the read, update, and delete. Same thing, okay? We're, we're assembling a controller. So if we go in there, we see a bunch of HTTP stuff. It wants a boundary. Okay, well, where is the boundary? Again, it's in core headers, looks a little bit bigger, but it's just a trait. Let's go back. Where does it come from? Well, over here, the implementation. Where are we? Well, all of a sudden in core, just in a different, different folder, right? Same deal, just an implementation of trait. It needs a gate. What a big surprise. We go to the gate, looks slightly bigger. We go back to the dependency injection point. Where does the gate come from? Well, it comes from, from over here, right? So over here, we jumped again into a persistence Postgres scrum. We could have jumped to something like Google Maps. And uh, that's pretty much it. This is a diamond architecture. You're the expert now. It's really not rocket science, right? Just program against interfaces. Make sure that the interface and the implementation of the interface are not in the same box. And you gain 
parallel compilation. In fact, let's actually demonstrate this. I haven't demonstrated this. So uh, let's go to the terminal. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to clean. And unfortunately, even when we clean, SBT actually has some caching there. Uh, we're going to go into SBT again. Okay. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to wait a little bit. I want to run an update to FESA dependencies, even though they're already cached. This sort of doesn't count. Okay. So uh, let me clear the screen in just a second. So if I if I run through the projects, right? So you're gonna see, okay, so we have like core headers, remember, at the very top. And we also have this one. In fact, let's let's actually compile this one. So let's do uh custom zero interop uh compile. Because I kind of want to like get it out of the way, right? Let, let's forget about the utils. Okay. So um again, so we have like the core headers at the top. As soon as core headers compile, this one, the core, the delivery and the persistence, they will start in parallel, right? So it's going to be like a fork join, like a scatter gather. And once all of them compile, the main will start compiling. Let's see this, okay? Just going to do compile, right? Core headers are compiling. As soon as they finish, boom, three things in parallel. And when they finish, we go to main. We also have the, you know, the shifted diamond for the tests. I believe I actually have tests. So uh, I think I can do test test compile like this okay so we also have the test okay so if i uh, had i cleaned everything uh uh from from the very beginning right like the um i have an alias ca right so which just like test compile so if you run this then it's kind of it's kind of harder to follow because like more things compile in parallel right because we we compiling for example the um the tests over here um it, it was very fast because um because SBT caches stuff, even when you're not talking about incremental compilation. So I'm going to kill it. I'm going to set it again. I'm going to clean again, and I'm going to show it to you a little bit, uh, a little bit slower. Come on, there we go. Clean. Let's also do update because I don't want uh, extra print lines. All right. So this is the fair game now. Okay. So you have like the core headers compiling. Everything waits until they compile. Okay. And then once they're compiled, we have one more thing in parallel over here, which is the which is the tests, right? This one, like this one, this thing was like added uh, to the parallel compilation because it's it's the tests now, okay? And then the the other ones uh, came in later. So the entire thing compiles in fourteen seconds. It's a tiny app. Yada, yada, yada. As I already mentioned, I'm actually planning to live stream and to take some app. I actually have an app in mind. I'm not going to tell you uh, yet what it is. And I want to uh, rewrite it to Diamond Architecture. It's an application that is already uh, written very well. It's written against interfaces. So it's going to be a breeze to rewrite it. In fact, like we probably not need to change much code. We're just going to like rearrange, like put them into different places. And then I'm actually curious myself. I've never done this. Uh, I want to see how... It's, it's a small app, but still, I want to see uh, how much faster it compiles. I hope you like these two videos. As already mentioned i already created a playlist for this and uh, once i finish this one it's gonna uh, like this video is going to be two and all the other videos that i have done before they're going to be like three four five and so on okay i hope you like this video i see you in the next one hopefully for now as always it's been vlad from devinsidey.com don't forget to like this video if you did subscribe if you want to improve the developer inside you and if you wish to support tech education consider doing so on github sponsors or patreon whichever you prefer and let's watch my videos weeks and sometimes even months before everyone else and most importantly take care